Hello, I'm Jeff Flax. Today I'd like to discuss how all of us at Hartford HealthCare can redouble our efforts to reduce the incidence of medical errors and serious safety events in order to better protect our patients. As you know, over the past nine years, we have worked hard to transform healthcare for the people we serve by taking four successive but overlapping steps for change. Our first two goals have been to make care for patients safer and to improve the quality of care with better clinical outcomes for all. We have also taken steps to increase transparency by sharing our results both internally and externally and to deliver better value in an environment that's increasingly focused on cost. These goals reflect our organizational's values, excellence, integrity, safety, and caring. They also reflect our mission to improve the health and healing of the people and communities we serve and our vision being most trusted for personalized coordinated care. The more than 19,000 people who work at Hartford HealthCare measure themselves against these benchmarks daily as a way of achieving them on behalf of the communities we are privileged to serve. Each and every day, we all work to create and sustain reliable, safe, and high quality healthcare across all of our settings, from hospitals to our emergency departments to our ambulatory sites and in our home care services. In the process, we have become a high reliability organization. I will now hand the presentation over to Dr. Rocco Orlando for a review of what a high reliability organization is, how it operates, and how it helps us to deliver safer patient care each and every day. Hello, I'm Dr. Rocco Orlando, the Chief Medical Officer of Hartford HealthCare. As Jeff just mentioned, Hartford HealthCare is on a constant journey to continually improve the quality of the care we provide. During the first phase of our transformation, Making Care Safer, we embrace the goal of becoming a High Reliability Organization, or HRO. The Patient Safety Network defines an HRO as an organization that operates in complex high hazard domains for extended periods without serious accidents or catastrophic failures by putting safety above all else. HROs operate under very trying conditions all of the time, and yet they manage to have fewer than their fair share of accidents. A classic example is the military aircraft carrier. As the PSN notes, despite significant production pressures, aircrafts take off and land every 48 to 60 seconds, constantly changing conditions and hierarchical organizational structure, all personnel consistently prioritize safety and have both the authority and the responsibility to make real-time operational adjustments to maintain safe operations as the top priority. While the concept of high reliability was pioneered in the aviation industry, it is highly applicable to healthcare, and this approach has been successfully used in healthcare settings across the country to prevent medical errors and medically induced harm. Like aviation, the healthcare environment is very complex, but with the adoption of HRO behaviors, patient harm can be drastically reduced, if not eliminated. Most high reliability organizations have five distinct characteristics. First, a preoccupation with failure, meaning that every employee is encouraged to think of ways that work processes might break down from small inefficiencies to major failures and to share their concerns. Two, a sensitivity to how processes and systems affect the organization. Leaders conduct regular rounding so that they can observe operations firsthand and talk with employees and supervisors to evaluate which processes work best. Three, a reluctance to accept simple explanations for any problems and a willingness to dig deeper to find the root cause. Fourth, a willingness to listen to those people who have the best first-hand knowledge of a task, system, or potential problem, regardless of seniority. Five, staff and leadership are trained to learn from and respond to failures and to continuously look for new solutions. At Hartford HealthCare, we have trained more than 12,000 staff members in these principles. High reliability has become part of the fabric of daily care in our organizations. In addition to beginning each day with a safety huddle, we are now focused on failure, mindful that being in the moment is a key step to eliminating human error. Just as important, we are redesigning our care systems to eliminate sources of error because we know that strong processes and systems keep our patients safer. Through our high reliability training, we have created a standardized way of working and improving that addresses quality across the board. 
Since 2013, the results have been dramatic. Hartford HealthCare has decreased serious safety events by more than 73% by taking bold, concrete steps to become a high reliability organization. We achieved this reduction in adverse events by implementing leadership rounding, introducing lean daily management, establishing one standard safety reporting system, reducing care variation by implementing checklists and protocols in care areas, identifying safety champions, highlighting patient stories, and holding daily huddles to promote and ensure patient safety. In so doing, we have drastically reduced harm to our patients as this chart shows, but over the last two years we have hit a plateau. While Hartford HealthCare is a national leader in high reliability among healthcare systems, we are not at zero, and that is our ultimate goal. Because further reductions depend so heavily on the daily actions of our clinical staff, leaders, and support personnel, it's become clear that we're all in need of a refresher on how to anticipate and prevent errors so that we can work together to drive patient harm to new lows. In short, to be most trusted for personalized, coordinated care as an organization, we must recommit ourselves to high reliability behaviors. It's important to recognize that errors can happen anywhere and to anybody. Some mistakes are due to a lack of knowledge or facts. The provider may not have received the correct information. The message was garbled or lost in transmission. For example, a radiologist left a message for a physician about a concerning finding, but the physician never received it. In other cases, the person in question has the required knowledge or facts to deal with the situation, but doesn't process that information correctly or doesn't respond quickly enough to protect the patient from harm. One example might be a provider who knows what the symptoms of preeclampsia are, but doesn't recognize these signs in a pregnant patient and fails to respond in time to prevent harm to the woman or her baby. Errors can also be skill-based, improperly inserting an airway or an IV, for example, or lapse-based, when because a mistake is made because someone isn't paying close attention to what they're doing or how a patient is responding. An example of a lapse-based error is giving a patient the wrong dose of medication. The likelihood that errors will happen increases when people are faced with factors that contribute to human error, distractions, stress, lack of time, uh, to a sudden influx of patients, fatigue, misuse of controlled substances, power outages that take an electronic health record offline. But whatever the reason, most patient safety experts believe that most medical errors and patient harm are the result of system errors. In other words, had the system been set up to make an error less likely, it might never have occurred. The bottom line, improving the system can help to improve patient safety. Now let's look at how errors may stack up to create serious safety events. The Swiss cheese model explains how human error results in harmful events. The model was developed by Dr. James Reason, a psychologist studying events in aviation. In most everything we do, there are checks and barriers designed to help catch errors and prevent them from resulting in safety events. Healthcare is designed with multiple barriers to prevent errors which can cause harm. The slices of Swiss cheese represent barriers. They include technology, for example, an electronic health record that gives alerts about potential drug interactions. They include processes, such as the policies for follow-up when labs are sent to pathology for evaluation. And they also involve other people, such as a coworker who sees us prepare to care for a patient without washing our hands and stops to remind us. Sometimes these checks and barriers fail, allowing errors to pass through like the holes in the Swiss cheese. When our best defenses fail us, an error that would otherwise have been caught carries through the holes unstopped and results in a safety event. Here is an example of how the Swiss cheese model operated in an actual case in a hospital in the southeastern United States. A pharmacist missed an order for a medication that was needed to keep a patient from excessively going to the bathroom. A floor nurse didn't notice the omission of the medication order. A second nurse didn't notice the omission of the medication order during a shift change report. A unit administrator found an order for a lab test confusing and put the order aside. A physician didn't follow up on the missing lab test result during rounds. A second physician was unable to identify the cause for the elevated sodium level. The patient developed seizures after four days of elevated sodium, coded, and died. As this case shows, these events are usually not due to just one error or limited to one professional group or department. On average, a serious safety event is the result of 8.3 human errors. If just one person in the chain had done something differently, the event could have been avoided altogether. 
Each of us has to look in the mirror and ask how we contributed to the problem. There are two basic approaches to reducing safety events, preventing human error and finding and fixing the holes in the Swiss cheese. While we can never completely eliminate human error by employing safety behaviors, we can significantly reduce the error rate and consequently our event rate. This is going to be our focus today, learning how to make fewer errors by using some simple safety behaviors. When dealing with patients, it's important to make every moment matter, critical to do the safe thing for every patient, every time. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. Drew Metzger, who will review the CHAMP safety behaviors that help us do just that. Hello. I'm Dr. Drew Metzger. Studies have shown that breakdowns in communication can lead to patient complications or deaths. In 2016, CRECO, a Harvard-affiliated patient safety organization, studied more than 23,000 medical malpractice lawsuits and claims by patients who suffered some form of harm. In 7,000 of these cases, the problem was caused because facts or findings were, quote, unrecorded, misdirected, never received, never retrieved, or ignored. Out of all the high severity injury cases reviewed, 37% involved some sort of communication failure. Crico estimated that these errors cost the healthcare system $1.7 billion, including the price of malpractice awards for serious injury or death. Not surprisingly then, at Hartford Healthcare, our first safety habit is to communicate clearly. One technique you can use to communicate clearly is the three-way repeat back. In a repeat back, the sender initiates the communication. The receiver acknowledges the information by repeating it back. The sender then acknowledges accuracy by closing the loop with the phrase, that's correct. That third step, where the sender acknowledges the accuracy of the repeat back, is extremely important. The receiver must listen for the words, that's correct. If the information is not correct, the sender must repeat the communication. We recommend avoiding responding to a correct statement with the words, that's right. The word right could be confused with the direction it represents. For example, left versus right. Across Hartford Healthcare, the phrase that's correct is a safety code word. It's part of the culture here. Since repeatbacks may not be a common practice in our normal lives, sometimes you may have to initiate it after receiving information from a colleague. At the bottom of the slide, you will see a good safety phrase to know. Let me repeat that back. That's your way of saying, I need a second and I want to make sure that I have this perfectly clear by repeating it back to you. It also tells the receiver you are expecting to hear a, that's correct, when you have finished sending the information. The three-way read back is the same as the repeat back, except the receiver writes down the information, request or order, and reads back what they have written. Don't rely on your memory. Write it down whenever you receive critical information that may be difficult to remember. The Joint Commission requires this for communication of critical test results, verbal orders, and telephone orders. The next technique we will discuss is called phonetic clarification. It's an outstanding best practice in oral communications when communicating a patient name, procedure name, medication name, or employee name. In these instances, spelling is often difficult and there are a lot of sound-alike words. When using phonetic clarification, you say the word, then spell it with a letter in addition to saying the word that starts with the letter. You will find this alphabet on your CHAMP card. Please use it to practice in those situations where a person's name, a medication name, or procedure could be confused. You don't always have to spell out the entire word phonetically. Sometimes it's more efficient and clearer to only spell those letters that can be confused with another letter. For example, Please go and take the blood sugar reading on Mr. James Pfeiffer. That's Pfeiffer with a P, as in Papa. It is important to point out that across Hartford Healthcare, you may experience different examples of phonetic clarification. For example, N as in November, or N as in Nancy. The important takeaway is to use phonetic clarification to ensure your message is received accurately. You will be surprised how often people can get stuck on simple letters and pick whatever pops into their heads, like N is in pneumonia, and Z is in xylophone. In numeric clarification, we say the number and then the digits to avoid confusion with sound-alike numbers, like 15 and 50. If a nurse is given a verbal order to administer 15 units of insulin, he or she may silently wonder, was that 15 or 50? 
A best practice is to commit to saying 15, that's 1-5, or 50, that's 5-0. This approach is clear and concise, and we use the separating words that's to avoid any confusion between the number and the digits. The best times to use numeric clarifications are when communicating medication doses, critical lab values, and patient or employee identification numbers. Listen to these similarities. 45, that's 4-5. Four 425, that's 425. When saying a range, like 4 to 5, use that's the range 4-5. Also, commit to using a leading zero where the number begins with a decimal. We see pretty good commitment to the written use of leading zeros in front of decimal points, but overall, there's still room for improvement in the verbal use of leading zeros. The correct way to say nine-tenths of something is 0 0.9. Phonetic clarification and numeric clarification help us to build a common language, making us much more reliable in our verbal communications. If at any point you do not have the clarity you need, ask clarifying questions. This is an essential part of communicating clearly. This technique may be used during any one of the techniques we mentioned here. You can start by saying, can I ask a clarifying question? This question is part of our common language. Now, let's take a look at how several of these techniques can be used in our workplace. Correct. Yeah. Excuse me, Dr. Mann? The yes. potassium on Mr. Smith is 4.2. Mr. Smith, potassium 4.2. That's correct. That's how it works. To prevent crises. Hi, Dr. Mann, this is Brita in the ICU. I uh, just wanted to let you know the hemoglobin on Mr. Smith is 6.2. You know what, let me write that down. And the hematocrit is 18. That's 1.8. Mr. Smith, the hemoglobin is 6.2, and the hematocrit is 18. That's 1.8. That's correct. Thanks so much for calling. I have a clarifying question regarding Mr. Harris. Do you have any concern for mesenteric ischemia? Yes, Mr. Harris does have significant abdominal pain out of proportion to, to the clinical findings. Phonetic clarification is used during verbal communication when words sound alike. It's often helpful to use phonetic clarifications for drug names and for patient names. Is this Mr. Brent or Brent? This is Mr. Donald Brent. That's B as in boy. B as in boy. Brent. For sound-alike numbers, use numeric clarification. Say the number and articulate each digit. 15 and 50 can sound alike. Was that 1515 or was that 5050? For a complex number such as 425, Articulate each digit. Four, two, five. I'll need 40 units of vasopressin, please. That's 40 units. That's four zero units of vasopressin. That's right. Again. Okay, can we continue compressions? Now, let's talk about our second safety habit, handoff effectively. In previous jobs, how many times have you wished you had more information to appropriately care for a patient or complete an important project? Do you spend a lot of time and energy just trying to catch up and figure out what has or has not been accomplished? The handoff effectively process is designed to provide a seamless transition when communicating important information during a handoff or transition of a patient care or project. It's important to remember that effective handoffs must occur prior to a change in a care provider or project owner, cover an entire shift or a portion of a shift, are interactive direct communications between care providers or project owners, minimize distractions, follow a standardized process specified by the department or service, may use a checklist to ensure important information is not missed or forgotten, and include an opportunity to ask clarifying questions. SBAR is a checklist we use as we hand off or transfer patients, materials, tasks, or information. It's a tool that helps structure the information so we don't miss anything that needs to be handed off to another person. You need to prepare for this, mentally or in writing, depending on the situation. SBAR can be used in both clinical and non-clinical situations, verbally, by phone, or in writing, such as in an email. Each letter stands for information that is important to the handoff. Start by identifying yourself and others involved, such as the patient, family, or other employees. Then state the following. The situation, 
which is the immediate problem or the headline. The background, a brief description of relevant history related to the situation. The assessment, which is your view of the situation. You might say something like, I think the problem is, or I'm not sure what the problem is. You should also give your perception of the urgency of the action needed. For example, the patient is deteriorating rapidly, or we won't be able to continue service without more supplies. Finally, state the recommendation, your suggestion about the action that should be taken to solve the problem, or your request for guidance on what action to take. While you're speaking, be sure to say the words situation, background, assessment, and recommendation so the listener knows the nature of the information you're providing. Always check to see if the other person has any questions. Ask clarifying questions yourself if needed. Let's take a look at two video clips that show an SBAR report. Here's an example of a less than effective SBAR. Oh, hi, Dr. McCarthy. Do you have a second? A second? Sorry, I just wanted to talk about Mrs. Holmes. What's up? Well, I spoke with nursing after rounds today. I was wondering if we should change her pain medication. I'm sorry. Who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm John, the pharmacist on the stroke unit while Tanya's away. Why change your medication, John? Why wouldn't we just up the dose? Well, the, the current med isn't fully relieving her pain, and uh, the team says it's making her drowsy, too uh, tired for her, um, her therapies. Uh, she's, she's reporting her pain at 7 out of 10 for the last... Um... Okay, what are you suggesting? Well, I don't, I don't really know this patient very well. Um, I, I could review her chart, uh, but that might take a while. Um, I, I'm not going to be here tomorrow. Tanya's coming back, so, so maybe maybe this should wait. But but Mrs. Holmes is really hoping to be home uh, for the weekend, um, uh, some big anniversary, and mm -hmm. uh, her husband is coming in this Thursday, so maybe one of us should talk with him? Okay. Now, here's a more effective SBAR. Hi, Dr. McCarthy, is this a good time? I, I need three minutes to discuss Mrs. Holmes. I I'm John, I'm providing pharmacy coverage to the unit. I have a few minutes, what's up? Uh, nursing raised a concern from rounds this morning. Um, the situation is that Mrs. Holmes' pain isn't being well controlled. Uh, she's sedated, which is having an impact on her participation in therapies, mm. and she's continually reporting her pain at seven out of 10. Now, okay. the background is that she's fallen three times since her admission to rehab, and she's requesting to go home at her first pass this weekend, uh, some big family anniversary. Uh, but my assessment is that we are not adequately controlling her pain, and what we're giving her uh, is contributing to these falls. Okay, so what do you recommend? Well, after reviewing her chart, I'm con uh, considering lowering her dose of opiates and introducing an anti-inflammatory, which would be less sedating and she should be able to tolerate. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, her husband is coming in this Thursday at 10. If you're available, we could meet to discuss. Okay. Sounds like a good plan. Let's meet back here and we'll talk to the family together. Okay. Listen to how the speaker uses the words situation, background, and assessment in his communication. When you organize your communication into an SBAR format, it delivers the information in a clear, concise manner, placing the recipient in a better position to understand your message. Now, let's discuss the third safety habit, attention to detail. STAR is recognized as the best tool for avoiding skill-based errors. STAR stands for stop, think, act, and review. When using STAR, you pause for one to two seconds, consider your action, concentrate and carry out the task, and then, if you have time, review to make sure that you got it right. The best time to use STAR is when going from thought to action. For example, identifying a patient, entering data into a device or computer, sending an email, documenting a thought or value, connecting tubing or leads, and any time before taking action with a patient. Stop is the most important part of STAR. It gives your brain a chance to catch up with your hands. Think about when you are purchasing a snack or a beverage from a vending machine. Right before you make your selection, what do you do to make sure that you get what you want? You stop and think. Remember, STAR is consistent with our values. Do the right thing the first time. Always take the one to two seconds to stop, think, act, and review. The average person makes approximately 10,000 skill-based decisions every day. Let's move on to our fourth safety habit, mentor and coach others. Cross-checking is the first of two tools you can use to mentor and coach others. Cross-checking means that we look out for one another and are not afraid to ask questions if we think someone is about to make an error or has made an error. 
The most important of these steps is to be willing to be checked, which supports an environment where we are open to input or feedback. How can you cross-check your colleagues? Offer to check the work of others. Second check a calculation, proofread a memo, offer to help a team member with their work. Point out work conditions or hazards that your team member might not have noticed, a floor that was recently mopped, a trip hazard in the lobby. Point out unintended slips and lapses, a supply room key left on the counter, an order placed in the wrong chart. Demonstrate a willingness to be checked by saying, thanks for the cross-check. Add this to our list of safety phrases. This is called being mutually supportive. Remember, the key to successful cross-checking is to be willing to check others and to be willing to have others check us. It is important to establish relationships with the people around you so others will be comfortable pointing out an error or question in action without any fear of retaliation. Remember, being mutually supportive also means you should recognize and provide feedback after you see people doing the safe thing. Arc It Up is the second tool we will discuss today to help you mentor and coach others. Arc It Up allows you to speak up for safety and helps us address a concern in a non-threatening way when our efforts to check and coach a coworker are being met with resistance. ARC stands for ask a question, request a change, communicate a concern, and if no success, use your chain of command. I have a concern is a phrase that should set off bells and whistles in our heads causing us to stop and address why this person has this genuine worry that we are about to harm a patient or make an error. ARC can be especially helpful when someone feels hesitant or intimidated to raise a concern to someone he or she perceives to be in a position of higher authority. Every organization should have a safe word, and at Hartford HealthCare, that phrase is, I have a concern. Here is an example of a nurse named Jill speaking up using ARC when a fellow nurse named John walks into a patient's room without washing his hands. Jill says, John, aren't we supposed to wash our hands upon entering a patient's room? John responds, he's not going to touch anything. Instead of acquiescing to this explanation, Jill asks John to please wash his hands in accordance with the infection control protocol. John says, he doesn't have time. Rather than letting it drop, Jill says, John, I am concerned about the safety of our patient and other staff. We have a hand washing protocol in place to prevent the spread of infection. But John continues into the room. Finally, Jill says, John, I am not comfortable with this. I need to speak with my supervisor. Notice that the nurse used her own chain of command, her supervisor, not her colleagues. Now, we will talk about our last safety habit, practice a questioning attitude. Where do we get information from? The information we use in our personal and professional lives. It may be from direct observation, test results, devices, or verbal or written information. In healthcare, we need to recognize situations or information that don't seem quite right and seek clarification before proceeding. When we think about practicing a questioning attitude, it's about training ourselves to be comfortable with asking clarifying questions, even if it means slowing down the process we are involved in. Validate and verify a two-step technique for processing raw information into fact is a wonderful critical thinking tool that can enhance patient safety. Validate is an internal check. Does this situation or the information that has been given to me make sense with what I know to be true or right? It takes seconds to do this because it occurs in your brain. This is your internal smoke detector. Does what you see or what you are about to do make sense? Does this sound right, feel right to me? These simple questions take only a moment to ask yourself. Verify is an external check of the information with an independent and credible source to corroborate your thinking. It may take a few minutes to do, sometimes many minutes because you have to get on your feet and do some work to track down the right answer. Next, let's talk about the concept of stop the line. When we say the phrase, stop the line, I need clarity, it is literal. Admitting that we don't know what to do or voicing uncertainty about a situation is courageous. Remember, Hartford HealthCare gives us permission to stop the line. If you are uncertain about what to do or what is about to happen, you have the permission to speak up. Hartford HealthCare encourages staff to stop the line and seek clarity when they have questions, are uncertain, or someone else raises concerns around the action they are about to take. We want them to review the plan, resolve the concern, and reassess the next steps before continuing on. This is for when you have an immediate concern about safety. You stop the line to seek the clarity you need to move forward safely. 
It is not meant to second guess the judgment of another person or to slow down someone's busy day. It is intended to make sure we don't continue down a particular path when there's uncertainty on the part of anyone. Just a reminder that our ultimate goal is to give our patients the best care we can and to keep them safe. It's critical that we keep all five of these CHAMP safety behaviors in mind and practice them every day with every patient. Now that Dr. Metzger has reviewed the top five ways to keep patients safe, I'd like to take a moment to discuss the importance of the H3W behaviors. In 2009, we launched How Hartford Healthcare Works, H3W. Since then, all of our employees, from frontline staff to the C-suite, have been trained in H3W leadership behaviors. The H3W initiative was designed to create a common culture of respect, accountability, high performance, and honesty. It continues to include a strong emphasis on staff engagement, accountability, data collection and analysis, and organizational communication. And it focuses on encouraging everyone in every position to think about and propose new solutions to the problems we encounter. Our H3W behaviors are linked to our HRO CHAMP behaviors. For example, the CHAMP behavior, mentor and coach others, correlates with our H3W leadership behavior, teach, coach, and mentor. Spend at least half your time developing others. The CHAMP behavior, attention to detail, correlates with our H3W leadership behavior, be in the moment. And the CHAMP behavior, communicate clearly, correlates with our H3W leadership behavior, provide timely, clear, and specific performance expectations and feedback. Our history has shown that practicing these H3W and CHAMP behaviors significantly improves the quality of patient care. Today's presentation has been aimed at providing a refresher on all of the things we do at Hartford HealthCare to improve patient care and patient safety. We've come a long way over the last few years, but as a high reliability organization, it's critical that we double down and continue to practice these patient-focused behaviors consistently and help our colleagues to do the same. It is only by doing so that we will move closer to our ultimate target of extraordinary patient care and achieve our common goal to make healthcare as safe and effective as possible for all of the wonderful people we serve. Before we wrap up our presentation, let's review today's discussion in the form of takeaways, key points to remember. First, effective teamwork and communication and documentation can help prevent unanticipated adverse events or mistakes, potential harm to patients, and malpractice claims against hospitals and physicians. Second, because healthcare communication regularly involves the participation of different patient care providers and support staff at different times, it is vital that communication is open, accurate, and timely. Third, the use of structured communication tools, closed-loop communication, and assertive statements of clinical concern when needed to ensure that there are no dropped balls or misunderstandings when it comes to the care of the patient. Collaborative communication not only involves asking questions, but also active listening, integrating information, sharing opinions, and a give and take relationship. Team members should be open to feedback and encourage all healthcare team members to speak up about concerns. Providers should document details of patient care, their medical findings, and their progress notes as close to the time of the patient encounter as possible. This allows for your information to be available to other caregivers in a timely fashion. Finally, Remember that at Hartford HealthCare, we strive to function as an effective, close-knit team. Treating your healthcare partners and our patients with the respect and understanding they deserve on a daily basis helps to build that team commitment and ultimately results in the best possible outcomes for all of us.